Thank you all for coming. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, I'm Victoria Ashby. I do government relations for the league, and I'm joined here by Council Member Kate Bradshaw from Bountiful, our host city here, and Mayor Jeff Silverstein from Mill Creek, and Ted Milton from Wasatch Front Regional Council. And so you have a really good brain trust this morning. Um, and what we wanted to talk about today is really encouraging our cities to reach out to legislators. Um, just by raise of hand, how many of you are city staff? And how many of you are elected? Okay, so we've got mixed here. Um, I, I really think that whether you're on the staff side or the elected side, you have a role in reaching out to legislators. And I mentioned this yesterday, but there has been a significant decline in legislators who come from local government on the Hill in Utah. Um, it used to be a traditional path for if you were in municipal or county government, you would then go up, um, depending on your opinion, sometimes it's a sideways or a down move, but you would go up to the Hill and become um, move into a state office. And that really has changed, um, I'd say in the last eight to 10 years. Um, and the problem is, is that we don't have brain trust up on the Hill to speak to bills that impact local government. There's just really no foundation. And admittedly, there are some legislators that are going to be antagonistic towards local government, no matter what you do. But I also think there is a big gap of legislators who just don't have the information they need. And if you spend any, if, if you don't have a life and you spend your life living up on the hill like Kate and I do during <laughs> session, um, what you will notice sometimes on bills, especially in the House, there's a board and every legislator, House member's name is on that board and they either turn green or red depending on how they vote. And when legislators just don't really know what a bill does, they will look at their colleague who they kind of trust and then, then they'll vote and then they'll flip their vote. And that honestly is how some of the bills work on the Hill. Um, and the truth is, is that our legislature passes a huge volume of bills or re looks at a huge volume of bills and it's very, very short 45 day session. And so you can't necessarily expect these elected officials who also have full-time jobs because their legislature is part-time to understand every bill that comes in front of them. And so what we are really trying to push to the league is to get a better foundation from our cities so that those legislators have more information when they're voting. And this does not mean that you have to commit um, your life to being up on the Hill for those 45 days. What we really need is people to be talking to their legislators all year, you know, two or three times at least to check in with them and develop good relationships. Because what you'll find is I, I used to work at Ledge Research, and my old boss would say that, and he's been a, he's been in the legislature for 40 plus years. He would say, Legisla legislation and policy making is 10% policy and 90% relationship. And I, I think that's pretty accurate. And if a legislator sees a local government bill coming to them and has questions and says, I, I know my city manager, I'm gonna call him and ask him about this, like, you, it has taken care of so much hard work of us trying to whip votes that don't know anything about the bill. So if you are an easy contact for that legislator, that relationship is already built in, like is a huge lift. And so what we wanted to talk about today is how you can build those relationships, um, techniques to do it. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, every city has its own unique needs and what it needs to accomplish and that's what you should be trying to push because even if every city is a little bit different just a better understanding of local government on the hill is really going to help us out so um just to you know in the news this morning was that maybe the pandemic pandemic is over uh, i'm gonna turn that news around and say, well, the pandemic on local government preemption is just getting started. So <laughs> if you think that this is only happening in Utah, here, here, here is some notice that it is not just Utah. So I listened in on a webinar from the voter, or excuse me, the Florida League of Cities a couple weeks ago. They are just finishing the Florida session there. And here, things were not going well in Florida. In Florida's 
political makeup is somewhat similar to Utah. Um, they saw a bill that would preempt local government from responding, responding to state of emergencies. Any of this sound familiar to anybody? Um, their executive order repealed all ordinances related to COVID. Their legislature started digging into municipal administration, including inserting themselves into local budgeting process. Um, initially, one bill said any resident could challenge a local budget. Now they modified it to just be a council member or the state attorney to uh, modify or challenge a local budget. Their legislature erased local referendums on pollution and the cruise industry. They had a bill preempting life, local licensing, and they had a handful of bills on short-term rentals. <laughs> In Arizona, um, tell me if this sounds familiar, they had a bill that required municipalities to approve single-family residential building permits within seven days of receiving a completed permit application. If the municipality does not issue the permit in that time frame, the permit applicant would be allowed to commence construction with a temporary permit. Um, and then from the local solution support center, which is this really great think tank on um, local government um, and looks at kind of national trends. Over the past decade, decade state lawmakers have increasingly taken control of where traditional core local powers, including local authority over elections, zoning, lobbying, and lawsuits. This trend continues and will expand. Three state legislatures are considering bills that would stop cities, counties, and towns from lobbying legislatures. Three states have bills pending that would limit or discourage municipal litigation. In these bills, um, it would give the state attorney general the power to initiate civil suits, approve contracts with outside attorneys, and approve contingency fee arrangements for local government. In the bill, it basically punishes localities for challenging state preemption. Um, another bill would prohibit local campaign finance laws. Three states have bills pending that would limit local authority over building designs and products. Florida lawmakers are considering close to 70 preemptions, that's seven zero, preemption bills, including many that claim for the state's power that have traditionally belonged to city councils. So there are, this is a national trend, it's coming from businesses, it's coming from think tanks like ALEC, um, locally, um, a good example that CAM gives is about eight years ago, Libertas, which is a libertarian group, didn't even exist. Now they have a staff bigger than the league. So this is a national trend that's happening. And, you know, I truly, I've been in the legislative realm for 13 years, plus two more years in D.C., and I really do believe in the contention of ideas and that you need opposition um, to get better policy, but um, we are seeing a significant trend targeting local authority and Utah is not escaping that trend. So I thought first we turn to um, our council member and mayor to talk about how they have built relationships with their legislators uh, and then we're, we'll hear from Ted um, about some of the work he's done at WFRC. Um, Kate has unique experience in that their representative ward was the sponsor of the internal EDU bill this year. And um, they did a lot of work with Representative Ward um, during session, but they also had built a relationship with them before session. And it would be great to hear Kate talk about that experience. Mayor Silverstreet um, has been involved. He's one of the league board members, and he's also involved with WFRC, which brings a lot of cities together and legislators talking about transportation efforts. And so I think it'd be interesting to hear about his experience working collaboratively, but also his work in Mill Creek. So, Kate, I'll turn it over to you to just kind of talk about your experience with Corruption Ward. And also, Kate is a lobbyist on the Hill, and so she, she has a lot of experience on both sides of this issue. That is true. My, um, my day job is to be a lobbyist. And so this just finished my 17th session up at the state capitol. Um, part of that time I've spent on staff for the state legislature before um, moving to the hallways, sometimes referred to as the dark side. Um, and so a lot of how I engage legislators in my city council role comes from the experience of um, spending time in the hallways and advocating for different bills at the state level. Um, 
I like to think of myself as Bountiful's unofficial lobbyist because uh, even though we are uh, a city of third class, we're a city of first class when it comes to spirit and, and uh, <laughs> a beautiful place to live, but we're not big enough to have uh, our own lobbyist up on the hill. So we rely on the league, um, and then I fill in a certain kind of extra role in that regard. Um, as Victoria mentioned, this this year was unprecedented. I've never seen so many bills aimed at so many parts of city governance. And unfortunately, um, one of the legislators represents Bountiful Representative Ward um, ran one of the bills that was most aimed at uh, city authority, zoning authority, uh, HB 82, which we affectionately just know as the ADU bill, uh, was something that he he proposed and sponsored. And it was particularly frustrating to uh, to me and my colleagues on the council because we had just spent the fall of 2019 uh, liberalizing to a certain extent, our ADU ordinance. We had been an early adopter. Um, we'd had it in place for a number of years, and then we're taking steps to, to expand it just a little bit. And we had um, a lot of back and forth about it on our council. We had meetings uh, at our planning commission with public hearings. We had two different uh, city council meetings where we heard the issue with public comment. Um, we had quite a bit of back and forth on our council of, of where we thought that line ought to be drawn. And I, somewhat ironically, Representative Ward and, and his wife, who are very engaged residents of our city, both participated in that, in those public hearings and those processes. And so we felt like we'd arrived at a really good spot for Bountiful, um, for those residents who were excited to put an ADU in their, in their home, and, and for those residents who were concerned about how it might change the nature of the single family neighborhood they had bought into. And so we, we felt really good about that, and we're quite dismayed when he opened that bill file. Um, because uh, Representative Ward and his wife are very engaged members of our community, and because really the nature of, of serving in local government means you are also by default very engaged in your community, we've spent a lot of time together. Um, not just me, but, but by the others on, on our city council. Um, we ran a uh, Parks and Trails Bond in 2019, um, and Representative Ward and his wife were part of that effort to support the bond. And, we spent a lot of time coordinating signs and donations and things like that to um, to run that bond effort in 2020 in a you know very weird year, and um, so that that allowed us to kind of build a relationship. Um, we've spent time laying sod with him at the Bountiful Museum. We you know we've done lots of different projects together to benefit our community, and so it I think allows us a certain ability to connect in a certain. Um, latitude to um, say hard things to each other and still come out friends on the other side. Um, as HB82 was moving through the legislative process and um, you know, Bountiful definitely upped its game in terms of our legislative engagement. For the first time ever, we started sending out um, uh, announcements to our residents about what bills were on our radar and how they would impact them and why therefore the city was concerned. Um, we upped our communications uh, to our uh, our small delegation of three legislators that covered Bountiful to let them know how we felt. And as the bill progressed, it became really clear that Representative Ward was, was pretty dug in and was heavily backed by House leadership in particular. Um, we tried a, a very different tactic, um, and it's one that I think uh, became a little bit famous of the state capitol for how we chose to do this. We invited Representative Ward to a city council meeting. Um, we asked him to engage with us in a public forum. He stood at the highest. We, uh, you know, we we sat in our seats and we um, we pushed him fairly hard on why he would take this local authority away from our city. Um, before we did that, we had we had uh, talked in, in a great deal as a council and um, with our city manager and with our staff about what those impacts looked like. Um, we were unified between our mayor and council in, in our frustrations and our opposition. And so we we um, kind of coordinated and mapped the messages we wanted to share with Representative Ward about how we felt his bill was going to impact us. One of the things I chose to share with him is he's a, he's a doctor by profession. He has a medical office um, in what's known as the hospital zone in Bountiful. 
near Lakeview Hospital. Um, it happens to be um, near my home precinct. Um, and so I'm very familiar with this, with this part of our city. And he was frustrated ab about the sign ordinance that we had for the hospital zone that was different than the commercial zones. And it limited how the building he owns with his medical practice and other practices could have this signage. And so in 2019, when he came with that concern about signs um, and said, you know, what, what could we do? Why are these two zones different? Um, we engaged with him. We engaged our staff, our city planners is here with us. We engaged with him on why these zones had evolved differently and did it matter? And could we do something that would um, help him retain tenants in his medical office building and uh, but be respectful of the fact that it nestles right up against a residential neighborhood? Um, and so through that process, we fixed, you know, we fixed his sign issue for his building. Imagine if to ever change a sign ordinance in a little neighborhood in Bountiful, Utah, we had to seek a legislative bill in 45 days. And we had to consider not just how it would impact this little neighborhood in Bountiful, but every neighborhood in every city, and therefore we'd never adopt another new sign ordinance ever again. And that his ability to directly reach out to me to find uh, you know, that common ground on our city council and work directly with our staff meant we could quickly move on his changes. Um, and that ever after with his bill, Bountiful would never be able to consider as a city that has significant residents on hills, how we handle parking free to use during a snow year. Um, you know, what is the right mix for um, some of our smaller houses built in an era with um, smaller driveways and smaller footprints, and some of quite frankly are very big houses up on the hill. And that, you know, I really challenged him that uh, knowing the legislative process like I do, we would never ever be able to find any way to tweak this ADU ordinance based on what he was doing. We would never be able to respect the local flavor that would be different from us than it might be for Mill Creek, or it might be for Woodruff, or it might be for Moab with, with resort communities. So we, we pushed him pretty hard. Every single member of our council had a different slice and personal connection story that they were able to tell, uh, tell him to his credit. He stood here and, and took that criticism and took that feedback you know, with uh, a crowd of people, um, which I thought was, uh, spoke a lot to, to his willingness to engage. Um, and the next day at the league, there was a meeting with Representative uh, Ward and House leadership, and he moved for the first time ever off his hard line on that bill and was willing to accept some compromises. Do I love HB 82 and the form it finally passed? No, I do not. Um, but it would have been a significantly more draconian bill, but for that engagement. And I think the, probably the, the rest of the story, the after story that's important is, you know, that could have left a big rift between the city of Bountiful and Representative Ward ever after. Um, and I think it's, it's really important, um, you know, there's, there's the saying of, you know, my 80% my friend isn't, isn't my enemy. And he's my 80% friend. And that there are a whole host of other issues where we do see eye to eye, where I need his engagement, where that, where that overlap between cities and, and the state are important. And so just this week, um, as this legislature begins to consider how to spend all of their ARPA funds and how they think we as cities ought to spend our ARPA funds, I texted him because I know we both care about secondary water metering. And I said, hey, I think there's going to be some money for this. We need to talk, we need to engage our, um, our secondary water provider here. Um, and so we jumped on the phone, we chatted, he set up a lunch so that we can continue that dialogue and something else we care about so we can share those overlaps. And I think that continued engagement is really important. Um, you know, I care deeply about trails in our community. Um, he, he's, a, you know, an outdoorsy guy, so he showed up to our most recent trail state project. And I was very happy to make sure that we shared his pictures on that social media to show he was helping our community on those projects too. And so that's something I think cities need to do a lot more of is constantly engaging uh, with their legislators on all of their issues so that when you have to have a hard conversation, they're willing to have a hard conversation with you um, and willing to, to um, you know, it's easier to hear a hard thing from a friend and, and um, you'll listen to it than to 
hear something, a hard thing from somebody you don't have any relationship with at all, or someone you think of as your enemy. It's so much easier to dismiss. Thanks, Kate. Um, I, I think that's a really important point is you don't you don't want to just always be the antagonist. You want to be a collaborator too, so that you can have these hard conversations. Um, at our annual conference, Mayor Nia House from Moab um, shared an experience that she had with the legislator a few years ago. Moab wanted to ban plastic bags, and there was a very <laughs> a draconian bill on the Hill in reaction to that prohibiting cities from prohibiting plastic bags. And the sponsor of that um, was at the time Representative McKellie, who's now a senator. And um, she spent a lot of time with him, talking him through that, trying to help him understand what Moab's concerns were. This year, Moab um, felt like they needed legislation to help with ATVs driving through their neighborhoods to the wee hours of the morning. And I, I have been in Moab during that time of year with my own ATV, although I go to bed at nine, so I'm not one of those midnight riders. Um, and it's pretty obnoxious. <laughs> and Senator McHale, who previously was on the other side from Moab, had a good enough relationship with them that he actually ran that bill for Moab. So, you know, you really need to keep those relationships and find ways to, to build to promote legislators when they deserve it and collaborate with them and sh you know show them off to their constituents because they are looking for re-election um, but at the same time hold them accountable mayor silver Strini, share some of your experiences on so, so i i want to talk about two different things uh the first thing i want to talk about is that um that we, we have um we have power in numbers okay and uh, to use the organizations that are available uh, for local governments to, to basically collaborate um, and and lobby um, effectively, I think is extremely valuable. Um, I kind of saw that, I'm so, so my background, I'm mayor of Mill Creek. Um, we're a city of 60,000 people. We're a brand new city, really, relatively four years. Um, so I, in, in my career before I became mayor, I was a lawyer and I did a little bit of lobbying for select clients. So I had had some kind of an experience going up there and uh, and I was just a, a baby lobbyist because I didn't do it very much and I just did it on discrete issues. But at least I had some background about the uh, about what was going on up there. And I could already see with respect to that, um, the league up there and uh, I didn't run into WFRC, it was Excellent Regional Council as much, but uh, I could see the benefit of, of, of that kind of organization. And and one of the things that we're trying to do, um, so I'm, I'm uh, on the league board, and I'm also the chair this year of Wasatch Front Regional Council. So, so I, I've spent a lot of time actually being up there representing our interests on both transportation and planning on the Wasatch Front Regional Council side and for the league. But what I see is that the league together, the, the staff of the league is extremely effective, and they and they are able to rally the troops and 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 send emails out and communicate with legislators in a way that's extremely effective. So I, I hope that everybody will appreciate what 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 that league membership means and what it does for us. And I would encourage you, um, you know, the website's easy to find. There's a board member that represents every district in this state. Um, and if you have issues, one of the things that you should do is make sure the league that they're on the league's radar that we that they know about. And most of them that they're good enough to know about. But but also if you have something that you need in your city or town that isn't on the agenda, let us know because we may be able to help with that. That's so that's on one side of strength in numbers. And then I'll just build on what um, what's been said before with respect to establishing rela relationships with your legislators. I mean, so for my city, that's it, it's a, a little more daunting. Some places you've got you've got a senator and a representative. We have four representatives that represent little parts of our city and two senators. Um, and what what I've also tried to do though is to work with uh, in collaboration with 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 legislators that I know represent adjacent areas. So you know uh, that you know the other cities around us have representatives, and the more people you can get involved um, and and understanding the issues, the better off that you'll be. Um, the other unique problem that we have in Mill Creek is that our representation is 100% blue, which is uh, problematic in a red state, okay? And uh, so it takes a special effort for me to go out and make sure that I'm, that I'm talking to legislative leadership when I can and 
um, and you know, trying to raise our issues up on on that and make sure that that uh, that everybody in the legislature understands that that my city is a team player and and we are on board with the things that uh, you know that we're doing the things that this, we think the state wants us to do. And I think it's really important whenever you have an opportunity to talk to a legislator to to let them know that 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 cities and towns are aware of these issues and we are trying to work collaboratively and we actually have done things. And I think that the Bountiful, you know, uh, accessory dwelling unit process is, is instructive on that. If more legislators knew that cities and towns were actually trying to grapple with this issue themselves, we, we're not ignoring it. We're not trying to just say no to it, but we are trying to fashion something that, that works to address the problem, but also is tailored to fit individual neighborhoods and specific problems. And like Bountiful, we had the same issue in Mill Creek about snow removal and some of our up neighborhoods up on the bench. And, and uh, you know, if we have too many car, cars parked in the street, we can't plow the streets. Uh, you know, we, we can't pay damage claims to cars that get hit by snow plows. And some of those streets are narrow and tiny. So so there is a need in some places to make room for off street parking, those kinds of things. A lot of that's just educating legislators about the fact that we, that we are working on these things. The other kinds of things that we've done and latched on to, um, which maybe everybody does, but I'll just point them out. Um, we try to include our, our legislative team in the things that this, our city is doing. And we've been fortunate that most of our legislators are willing to participate in those things. So in, in Mill Creek, we have uh, community councils, which are kind of like neighborhood meetings, if you will. Um, and we involve them in our planning and zoning and in our ordinance process. So, so our legislators come to those meetings because they're grassroots, right? They're meeting with actually their constituents there. Um, and they hear things there and participate in that. So they kind of know what we're, what we're doing. They know that we were working on an accessory dwelling unit ordinance that, that actually the, you know, House Bill 82 came out with pretty close to what we were thinking about. You know, I, we don't like the fact that it, that it took that away from us. But, you know, the point is we work working toward those same goals. I think our legislative delegation kind of understood that. Um, but but having them come to those things, inviting them to city, civic events, make sure that they know that there's if there's a parade or a uh, or a barbecue or anything like that, they get invited to that. Gives you a chance to interact with them, maybe introduce them um, to their constituents, say say a few words, but build that relationship so that so that you know um, they're willing to ask you during the session, what what should I do. Make sure that you, with all of them, that you ask them, what is the best way to get in touch with you during this session? How would you like me to communicate with you? And then also invite them to, to ask you questions. They get bombarded by hundreds of bills and they may not appreciate all the impacts that those may have. So it's, I, you know, I actually invite them to say, if you have a question about a bill, I can't guarantee you that I'm a resource, but, I, but I'll at least tell you that. But I, but I would appreciate if you just ask ask about that if you have a question about something um, to get our input. And I found that they usually want to listen to you um, at, because they they want to do the right thing too. That the, the remarkable thing about our legislate, legislature is that just like people in local government, they care about our state. They really want to do the right thing. And and sometimes it's a mat, just a matter of trying to get um, the time with them to educate them about that. We do uh, we do a breakfast with all of our legislators in, the, in advance of the session, usually in December because they get busy afterwards. Um, we try to have them come in, meet all of our council members, meet some of our staff, um, and talk about the things that we know that might be coming up during the session. It's impossible to know everything like that, but that also helps build that relationship so they get to know people. Um, we have we have staff meetings in our city during the session to make sure that our that our electeds and our staff are on the same page with respect to our position on legislation. It's easy for the building official to be um, be off with the with their association or the planners and not recognize that maybe uh, maybe the council isn't on on that page with that legislation, but it's important to, to do that. And then we've also been able to, you know, even during the, the ADU ordinance, our planning staff was, was in contact and being a resource to some of the legislators um, about what we were doing and, and that, and why we were concerned about being able to, uh, you know, uh, require an additional parking space off the street and things like that. So, 
being on the same page about that. And, uh, and you know, really it's just, it, it's, it is all about the, the relationships, if you can build those. And that's true. Uh, it's true in the city government. It's also true when, when you're lobbying on, you know, for the league or for the Los Angeles Point Regional Council. And then the other thing that I think that 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 is helpful, if you see issues coming up, you know, to reach out to your fellow, you know, uh, neighboring jurisdictions, and to the, the to the extent that we can be on the same page and 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 form a plan about contacting legislators, it divides the work up, but it also I think helps um, helps solidify that we're not just an outlier and we're not we're not uh, taking an isolated position that this is something that's shared by by our neighbors as well. And, uh, and you know, you might even learn a, th a thing or two by doing that too, so. Thanks, Mayor. So I'm gonna give everyone, I know we're a small group, I'm gonna give everyone a minute to think of questions you might have for these two. Um, I do wanna emphasize one of the points he made, which is, so I, I spent two years working for the US Senate for a senator back there, and then I've worked at the legislature here. Um, and. Many of you may talk to people who don't even realize there's a legislature happening up <laughs> on the hill in Utah. <laughs> you know, there's not an understanding between Congress and the legislature. But I can tell you, between my two experiences, the federal is all different. And you shouldn't be thinking of federal the same way you should state. Our state legislators are really responsive to people who reach out to them particularly the squeaky wheels, but also the ones who have good relationships with them. I drafted bills that legislators opened because one person sent them an angry email and wanted this get done. Someone they didn't even know, it was just a constituent. So you should you should not be intimidated or feel like they are unreachable. Um, I ran into a, a state representative at the grocery store one time, and of course I know who she was, Anyone else walking past us had no idea who she was, right? Like that's just the life of being a state legislator. But they really are responsive. They might not agree with you, but I do think, like he said, that most of them really want to do what's right. It's just getting them to be able to focus and understand a fuller picture that's important. Any any questions? I'll let Meg pass the mic around just so we can get on our recording. It seems like ideally there should be better communication or trust between the residents and their cities. Is it is there an issue there? Are residents not trusting their cities so they go directly to the state legislature? In my opinion, um, this is frustrating me because my whole life is spent in politics and government. And so um, I know that it is not my purview to solve like immigration issues at our border. Um, I'm, but I can definitely take care of your pothole. Uh, I have found throughout my career, whether I was working for the state legislature or in the city role, most people are not sure which levels of governments do which things. Um, and I would say that was definitely true in COVID where they would send uh, emails about masks and vac vaccines to everybody up and down the chain. Um, and so we, residents often I find don't, don't know which level is supposed to tackle a certain issue. Um, they're very confused about counties, by the way, what counties do, especially along the Wasatch Road. Um, and so they will just... So are we some. Yes, <laughs> especially in our wall wall uh, city and counties. But so they'll, they'll send the email to whoever they can get a hold of. And sometimes I think it's those big names that are in the media more. Uh, I'm, I'm confident that our US senators and our governor probably get emails about the potholes and bountiful just as I get uh, emails about vaccine safety. And it's not something I can do. So I don't think that as residents don't trust their cities. It becomes, if you're unfamiliar, you just hit whoever you, you think you know or whoever's email is easiest to find. Um, and then if you do happen to know someone, if, if your legislator is in your neighborhood or your ward or something like that, then you you, you go to that person. Or if you know them because you're in a, you know, a business group or, you know, you're the Realtors Association and they spoke at your conference, then you you go to them. But I, you know, I, I find um, uh, legislators at the state capitol, the group they interface with the most are lobbyists and organizations for different big groups. You know, so they're dealing with um, 
the UEA, they're dealing with um, the League of Cities and Towns, they're dealing with the Manufacturers Association, they're dealing with the police unions, and they don't deal with their residents as much because that's not, quite frankly, whoever really comes up with the capital is rare. At the city level, all we deal with is residents. I, I agree with what Kate said. I think there's a lot of confusion by, by people about who's responsible for what. And so, you know, I've actually, this is one of the things I've talked about with our legislators. Like, if you get an inquiry about a, a municipal problem, just send it to me and I'll take care of it. And, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll, you know, you know, if I get something that's a state, state law question as well, I won't try to dump on you, but I will at least let you know about that concern so you can address it because a lot of them want to be responsive. Um, I think who uh, badmouths cities to legislators is really more, um, you know, either industry groups or people that have had an anecdotal bad experience on something like getting a building permit or something like that. They they might do that. that. And, and frankly, um, as, as Victoria mentioned, you know, sometimes legislation gets modeled based upon one angry email. And that's a constant. I don't know how to fight that, but, but you know, constant examples are made of 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 us with respect to things where th there may not even be a complete understanding about what happened. The building permit wasn't granted because there was a problem with it, right? Um, and that doesn't get explained. It's just that it took me forever to get a building permit. Well, it's because your architect didn't get the plans revised or something like that. And th that's why it is important to try to talk to legislators about some of this stuff. And it's really difficult sometimes to track down exactly what the, the problem is. I mean, that's one of the things I think it's fair to ask about legislation that that um, that cities pass as well as the state but like what is the problem here you know what, what is there a problem that we really need to address or is this or is this just a one-off or a or a you know a mistake that happened and we're sorry you know mistakes do happen uh, we don't like it but you're, we're human you know anyway uh, that's responsive thank you so what I'm going to talk about is a little bit of a compliment uh, to what we've heard so far, and it's more aimed at the 10 months outside of the session. Uh, you know, there's this sense, I think, that we all have that um, there's, there's a growth freak out right now in Utah, and it's, it's at a new level, higher than I've seen in my career, even though Utah's been growing rapidly for 30 years. Uh, just this sense that things are different now. Um, and I think it's heightened by COVID and it's heightened by more in migration and it's heightened certainly by spiking housing prices. You know, in the last year, 25% increase in one year in Davis County. That's crazy, right? And so there's understandably this concern of wringing of hands of, well, what do we do? And in that context, Everybody sort of understands and rightly, rightly acknowledges that, well, oh my heck, so many of these issues flow through local government. They're affected by local government. And I think that that's why the magnifying glasses come out and they look at what is happening in local government. And so we need to talk about what we are doing, uh, what we do all the time, and that we are working on these things. Um, it, it's, it's, it's almost like in the middle of this growth freak out, we have to remind people that yes, we are working, we are tackling these things as local governments and it takes time. We cannot address these issues like that. Council, council person Bradshaw talked about, you were working on your ADO, ADU ordinance before, uh, is it HB 82? And I don't know how long you spent working on that, but you were in the middle of it and you and it takes some time to work through those things. So how do we talk about these things? I hope that that uh, a few of these kind of general um, reflections that I'm going to share with you will be useful for that other 10 months and for kind of talking more about what cities do, how they respond to issues that cities work. And so you can kind of think of these as principles to use when sharing your story. This is the context of people understanding what communities do and that we as communities, we are working on issues. Um, but one basic thing to note is we all have a negativity bias. Everybody does. 
uh, we focus on the bad. Uh, a, a community that maybe is not as responsive about housing issues, a developer that had a bad experience. Not only do we focus on the negative story, I think we all know this, the negative story gets shared more often, disproportionately. It gets disproportionately shared. So we have to do a lot of work to really tell the story, not just of the good work that we're doing, but also the good work that we are in the midst of doing, that we're in the flow of, uh, to combat not just the negativity bias, but also the fact that the negative story is disproportionately out there. Uh, so some of these are really uh, kind of straight ahead, but we need to speak to broad issues. This is the Utah Foundation survey of Utahns, key issues. Not all of these are um, relate to local government. A lot of them also relate to national government. So it's kind of a flow of, of different things, but just glance down the list and think about those that relate to local government. Some of them, people don't always link to local government, or we don't speak to the link when we talk about what we do. Jobs in the economy, there's a huge local government tie in there. Do we speak to that enough? I think we don't. Public health, do we speak to the role of our communities in improving public health? I think we actually don't. Housing affordability, there's a huge known link to local government. Are we talking about what we're doing in that space? You can kind of go down the list. Air quality is one. It's an interesting thing when you talk to local government representatives, it's really inconsistent how many think what they do affects air quality. It does. How people get around, how far they, how far they travel, those are local government issues. And you can kind of go down the list, obviously transportation and traffic, key local issue, water supply and quantity, quality uh, uh, relates to local, et cetera. So we need to speak to that. So here's an example. You could have a community and it's working on a main street revitalization. Well, why might they be doing that? They might be doing that for really good local reasons. A better look and feel of a street, better tax revenue, right? A responsiveness to local businesses that want, that want to be more vital. Those are totally good, valid reasons. What's the story about that revitalization that speaks to these broader issues? Does it, you know, does it mean that there's more people that can walk and bike and there's lower air quality? Does it mean that there's more housing and that has a housing affordability benefit? Are there these kinds of benefits that we can speak to instead of, in addition to speaking to the local benefit? Not instead of, but in addition to. That's, that's one principle. A second principle is let's share the story of how we are collaborating. And you heard that uh, from the other speakers as well. Let's talk about how we are working together. You know, the, the image there on the lower left is of... Uh, county officials from Weber and Davis County and Economic Development Corporation of Utah getting together and saying, look, we function more economically as a team. We're working together. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about how your city is involved in that. Be part of the League Army. Really utilize the partnerships that you have. Talk about the partnerships that you are engaged in in planning, in rolling up your sleeves and solving problems, what are those uh, uh, areas of collaboration that you're working on? The Wasatch Choice uh, Regional Vision is an example of that. Here is, here's a, a random example. The Mid Valley Active Transportation Plan, Midvale, Holiday, Mill Creek, Murray, Conwood Heights, Taylorsville, getting together and saying, you know, let's, let's work towards improved and maintain quality of life in Utah in the midst of rapid growth by helping people get to where they need to go without a car and having really great livable communities. This is also economic development. This is helping attract and retain skilled labor uh, in our region. These are the kinds of tie-ins, but it's the story of 
communities working together. And I think that that really resonates. I believe it does. Uh, um, with those that might say, oh, local governments aren't doing enough. Are you kidding? Not only are we doing so much internally, we're working together. Uh, the Wasatch Choice Regional Vision is a really great example of communities working together. And it is totally voluntary. Every community that is involved in this uh, just said, you know, these are ideas that we want to work on together with each other as we think about where our valleys and our metro area goes, the future of transportation. We're going to coordinate our local vision with regional transportation and have it be the story of where we all go together. And I think uh, the great thing about communicating your community's role in Wasatch Choice is the key point. It's voluntary. This was done not by coercion. This was done because communities care, care about coordinating with each other, collaborating. So let's talk about these kinds of things. Uh, the third and last principle, I hope I'm not taking too long here, is um, let's show bang for the buck. Let's talk about how what we're doing uh, improves life in more than, more than one way. Um, this is what I think the legislature has shown that they care about uh, in some of the recent pieces of legislation. This is one that I think a lot of communities uh, sort of understandably grown about because it's new requirements. But here are some of the things about Senate Bill 34 that addresses housing affordability. It gets at, and I'm sorry there's so much text on here. Don't read all the text, but here's the main thing. There look, it's, it's on the surface a housing bill, but it's a housing bill that seeks to make a difference on transportation and traffic by having housing and locations that reduce future growth in travel demand. And it seeks to, through housing, improve the economy by helping to uh, connect workers with jobs, okay, so that our economy functions better. So there, the legislature was thinking, how do we get bang for the buck? We need to do the same thing as local governments. How is what we are doing addressing multiple kinds of benefits? Um, I think I wanted to just give you a, a key example. There's lots of different ways you could do this, but a key example is where you are growing, where you are encouraging growth centers, for example, this is the part of the Wasatch Choice map and these orange polygons are um, places where communities have said, look, these are good places for us to grow as Utah continues to grow. And when you glance at that and you see how those relate to the red and blue lines, reds are major roads and blues are major transit, basically what you see is they're interrelated with each other. And when they're interrelated with each other, lots of growth happening where there are transportation choices. The bottom line is you get all these kinds of benefits on the lower right. Shorter driving distances, more transit use, uh, improved air quality. You're helping workers get the jobs. You're actually helping households afford life, not just through more transport housing choices, but reduced transportation expenses. So this is a way for us to talk about what we do and how it improves life in lots of different ways. And Ted, can I, I I'm going to interrupt you for just a second because... The last slide, uh, you know, SB 34, which was, you know, uh, not last session, but the session before, is a, actually a really good example that we can talk to legislators about where we collaborated with them to, to come up with this bill. We, we work with Senator Harper really closely, both with the league and WFRC, to, to fashion something that was going to work for everybody to address the, the problem of growth and affordable housing in Utah. And, and, and this is an example really where the league and our member jurisdictions were actually working with the legislature and advocating for something rather than what we always get accused of, which is being saying no to everything. OK, and, and that's one of the strategies that the league board is trying to come up with and address is how can we get to yes? How can we get to a point where uh, where our legislators understand that we are willing partners? We just need to be let into the policy discussion early before it gets set in cement so that we can 
we can structure something that works for the state and works for local government, works for our residents. So, I mean, that's actually just an example of something that, that I think that works. And we should be talking about that with our legislators too. We are not against everything. We are, we can be, we can be proactive and, and solve the problems. We just need. So Cairns, downtown Sandy, that's an example. I just wanted to tell you, you know, these places are coming out of the ground. They're advanced planning. Bountiful's done planning like this. My town in North Salt Lake has done planning like this. Uh, Mill Creek has done planning like this, not just planning, but seeing the fruits of that planning of this coordinated, uh, uh, coordinating growth with transportation. Um, we're also have been working with the league to, to, uh, not just help you share the anecdote, which is really important, but to also wrap our heads around, well, what do the numbers look like? And I think that uh, numbers are a really good way to uh, counteract the negativity bias. You know, let's, let's just talk about how things are going. Um, we uh, asked, uh, we did a survey of the community development directors in, uh, in our region. Um, so we got 41 responses out of, uh, I, I think that's like 75% response rate, 70% response rate, pretty, really good, uh, detailed survey asking them about, you know, how are you addressing growth and housing and meeting new general plan requirements. And, uh, if, if you came forward and participated in the Wasatch choice regional vision, how is that going? That kind of story. And we, one of the things we did is we just asked the question, well, what have you been doing the last couple of years that you want to talk about things that help us address growth? Um, the way we use streets, parks and open space, better street connectivity. So we're taking the load off of, of state, uh, roads, um, doing new things with parking so we can accommodate growth, bicycling, other like communities are doing a lot of stuff. Um, and we wanted to try to quantify that. Um, I was doing my math. Like. 80% 80 is not easy enough to understand. Anyway, 80% <laughs> uh, have done active transportation planning. 80% have improved the walkability of their sites. 70% have, have done a correlation job of how is growth occurring with transportation. These are things that relate to Senate Bill 34. Uh, so anyway, I, I um, wanted to just uh, provide some of those basic thoughts of these three principles as you share your story with an eye towards helping the broader community, including legislators, understand, hey, communities are rolling up their sleeves. It takes time. But we have to work really hard to, to counteract the negativity bias and the disproportionate sharing of the negative story by really getting out there. And we should just not just talk about what we've accomplished, but what we're in the middle of doing. Speaking to the broad issues, telling the story and and participating in collaboration and really, uh, if we can, uh, talk about how what we're doing has multiple benefits. So those are um, my slides. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Um, any questions for Ted? I think a couple of points that he made are really important. One is there are legislators who are data geeks. Like I, I went to law school. I didn't go to med school because math is not my friend. But there are a lot of legislators who are total data geeks. And if you can get them data and maps and all that good stuff, they will eat it up. And it is convincing to them. And I think the second point is our state legislators are elected to run the state, right? So if the state has a problem, like a housing crunch, they want they don't get elected to not do anything. Like legislators like to have bills. Um, and if you can help them understand like this is what our city is doing to help this state problem like help feed that narrative um it is incredibly helpful because otherwise they just have an impression of well no one's doing anything about this so we're going to do something and something might not be the best solution but they feel like they have to do something that's why they got elected to office so if you can help them understand what your city is doing about these issues, transportation, growth, 
all those sort of things. It helps them feel like, okay, there is some groundwork going on this. How can we as the state be a partner in it instead of a dictator on this issue? And I think it's also useful to uh, try to explain that one size doesn't always fit all. I mean, we have a range of communities uh, and uh, different economies, different resources and all that. And when the state tries to fashion something, sometimes it's that blunt tool that, that uh, you know, our, our, the, the beauty of municipal government is being able to, is local control and being able to fashion solutions to problems that actually fit our communities. And, you know, we, th that means we can't duck our responsibility. I mean, we all face that with growth. You know, I, people say all the time to me, well, why don't, why don't we put that someplace else in some other community, right? We, we do have a responsibility to, to, to help our residents understand that we aren't going to solve the problems we have statewide by putting our head in the sand and not being part of the solution. We all have to do that. But it's just like the ADU ordinance. There are so many different circumstances in different communities that re, that that where that local control actually makes a difference. And 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 also let's help our legislators understand that you know the reason that people uh, you know formed cities was to have that local control. And I can tell a great story about that because my city's new and we incorporated just for that very reason to get more local control. But that's 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 why cities work. Is that and and when the legislature intrudes on that province, they really are are doing themselves a disservice. It's going to come back to to haunt all of us in terms of us not being able to to you know preserve the quality of life that our residents want by by listening to them and responding to their desires. That's why we're elected. Um, I think um, this is a good point to transition to what the league's trying to do this year and. Um, We'll end with this initiative. Um, Meg, maybe if people don't have the handout that's at the back, if you could pass that out. Um, you actually are all the first the first group to get this. We're, we're right now having the designer to make it look, mu look much prettier than I can in Word. But um, this is our city's work, um, Tell Your Story initiative. And the idea behind this is we've created this template to help you talk to your legislators. And the idea is that you're not gonna do exactly what's on here, but hopefully it will give you ideas about how to have these conversations with your legislators. And I mentioned at the beginning that there's a role for staff and electeds. Elected officials um, are very good at talking to other elected officials. Like they're good at swapping crazy campaign stories and constituent problems and all that sort of thing. Staff are very good at giving like, here's the hard data, here's actually what's happening, helping those elected officials um, or, you know, speaking directly to legislators to give them the facts about what's happening in their city. So I think there's a role for everybody in this. Um, so, and when we say story, a story is not necessarily a piece of paper or a conversation. It can be a lot of different, um, a different ways you approach your legislator. I wanted to touch on these tips there on the first page. First of all, stick to the story. Whatever it is that you as a council or staff, you know, council and staff working together, decide your legislator needs to hear, stick to it. Legislators are inundated with information, right? Kate's clients are sending them stuff. The league's sending them stuff. Like, they are swamped. Um, so make sure it's concise and tight. It really gets to the point that you could do it, you know, it's like the cocktail napkin conversation, the 20 minute conversation um, that you get those two to three really key points on. Tell it in person. This is to create those personal relationships. You know, we would ask that you invite your legislators to spring council meetings so they can report on what happened during session and fall so they can tell you what they're thinking about running for the next session. And then if you can do more in between, fantastic. Um, but bring them into those council meetings and talk to them. Hey, can I uh, add a point there? I have become a fan, especially after what we've been through of not being together for the last year very much, of the unstructured hangout time, um, which is a phrase I've stolen from one of my council colleagues. Invite legislators to your unstructured hangout time. Um, if you're going to be doing a community service project, you're going to be planting flowers in one of your park gardens. The things that you share and bond about while you're, you know, digging in the dirt or picking up garbage or doing, you know, some project with your youth council, that that gives you so much time to tell stories 
and to build your reservoir so that during the session when you need to send them a text conversation, they're interested in it is so important. Unstructured hangout time. No, I think it's really good. Remember when you were in third grade and your teacher said there was a field trip coming up and that was like the best part of the school year? <laughs> Take your legislator on a field trip. Um, whether it's just something that the city's already doing and you're going to invite them to it or you plan a tour of a plant, you know, your facilities. Like, I think that's a really good point. Um, keep it local. Like, we don't. We don't expect you to like take these big issues that are happening on, you know, if you live on the Wasatch back, talking about the Wasatch front, like talk about what's happening in your city. As far as a structured time, like drive them or say, you know what, we're gonna take you on some of the development projects. We know you're concerned about housing. We're gonna take you on a drive. We're gonna show you what's happening. If you wanna talk to the developers, we'll even get them there. Like take them to the ground drive them through their communities and their districts. Um, talk about specific things unique to your community. Um, I would not hesitate. Now, again, like I'm throwing a lot at you, but also telling you to keep it concise, but don't um, underestimate how little they might know about municipal government. So, you know, really kind of frame some of this in the very brief context of this is why you have local government because the legislature is not good at passing bills to fix the pot home in front of Kate's house. You know, help them better understand the role of your municipality and that your health, safety, and welfare powers. Um, throw them a lifeline, like give them contacts that they can call. You know, Mayor Silvestrini, I, it's great that when he sees a bill and hears a concern about a building permit in his city, he tells that legislator, I'm, I'm on it. I'm gonna follow up and I'm gonna let you know. Give them the phone numbers of the people in your city who are going to give them, um, you know, really back up when they see difficult bills on the hill. And I've got Kate's unstructured time. Do it, go on the field trips. And then share your story successes. Like if they come to your city council meeting or they're on unstructured park time, put it on your social media. Like legislators are running for office, so help them run for office, right? Like. You know, get their name out there. They really appreciate it. Um, and then share it with the league too, because we want to give these examples to other cities. So I'll just briefly go through here and then I'd love to hear if you guys have any ideas that you know, you're thinking do with your city or if you have examples that have worked with your city um, or even if you've had bad experiences, let's hear about them and maybe find ways you know, to improve. Because I do think that if you have don't have a great relationship with your legislator, you need to find a way to mend fences, to find common ground and figure out how to kind of hit the restart button with that relationship. Um, our first template is the role of local government. We just have some examples here. Um, one, the first one is unfunded mandates. All of you are familiar with legislation that says, hey, here's a great idea from the legislature. Uh, we're not going to give you, we're not we're not gonna change your revenue sources, we're not gonna restructure property tax, but you're gonna pay for it anyway. And um, I've attached to the back of this a really great example from Salt Lake City that touches on, on the template one and two here. The second template of green progress hurdles and Angela talked about that yesterday. Salt Lake City's Nick Norris put together this really great um, point by point of what um, House Bill 82 it needs for their city. So he went through it and said, okay, this is how long it's going to take to implement. This is how many staff it's going to take. These are the ordinances we have to change. Up at the legislature, each bill has a fiscal note where the legislative fiscal analysts send a bill out to different executive agencies and the agency says, bam, this is gonna cost us X amount. So legislature, you better appropriate money for us. There is a part on the fiscal note for local government, and we do our best to estimate, but it's gonna be different in every city. And the hard part is that the legislature doesn't have to worry about how it's paid on the local level. You'll you'll just find a way, right? Like you've got banks of, you've got cash boxes hiding around the city. So what, this is a really good example is to take your city, do something like this on a piece of legislation and take it back to the legislator whether you can do it during session, which is hard because it moves so fast, 
or even after session and say, this is the on the ground impact of the bill that you voted for. Because they really are disconnected, I think sometimes from what the implication actually means for a city to implement some of this legislation. So I'd encourage you to go through Nick's example because I, you know, I know every bit city's got, you know, stretched staff, but if there's a way for you to do this, I think it speaks a lot to legislators who, who you know, maybe they're not the sponsor of the bill, but then nonetheless they voted for it. And then after session, they're like, oh, I didn't realize that was, that's what that was gonna do. <laughs> um, so, you know, talk about the impacts of um, the role of local government and what happens. The next one um, is one size fit, misfits all, and this has already been touched on, but the legislature cannot easily govern pinpoint communities and legislation. There are legal reasons why they can, political reasons why they can't. So you've all seen bills where you're like, this makes absolutely no sense in our community. Figure out a story, like take the example, why it doesn't fit in your community and tell that to the legislator. Call them up, you know, put together a one pager, explain like, this is what you thought was gonna happen with the bill. Well, here are all the things in our community that this just does not even make sense. Um, and then the last one that I have on there is municipal challenges, accomplishments and roles. So talk to them about, you know, we've been trying to upzone and yeah, our constituents have all these concerns. Like we need you, they're your constituents too, you know, potentially invite them to a planning commission. Very few have our legislators been to an actual planning commission. And I'm, I, after having been on the Hill for so long, there are not a lot, there's a few, but there are not a lot of legislative hearings that get as rowdy as probably some of your city council and planning commission meetings. Um, people just don't come up on the hill. Um, they're kind of distanced from the everyday implications. So invite them, let them see what um, some of these meetings look like. Um, talk to them about how you've partnered if you're was that's choice, talk to them how, yeah, we get regional planning and concerns. You don't need to tell us to do that. We're already doing it. We're talking to our neighbor cities. You know, invite them to those discussions, show them the maps, let them know that you're actively thinking about these issues. Um, and then, you know, I think really you need to see your accomplishments, which Ted's already touched on. Like, you know, if you have a big project coming on or Mill Creek just redevelop their, their city square and their, you know, bring them to tour that area. Let's show them how it's connecting to transportation, how you're thinking about, yeah, we've heard that there's two, you know, the state is just growing too fast. We were thoughtful in how we planned this community. We want you to come down and see how it's walkable community. Um, I think that if we can get more of our cities together to do that, um, the power of the league will really show up in the legislature. Um, we as the league staff, we are more than happy to get out there and whip votes and talk to legislators and try to help them understand this. But if they're hearing it from all of you, it's going to make a bigger impact because you live in their district. You're familiar with the problems. You're familiar with what's happening. And I think we're just missing that part. And so we're, we really would appreciate everyone, you know, rallying the troops and having these conversations. And it doesn't take a lot of time. Um, and the best thing is after you've built these relationships and they see a bill on the Hill and they're like, gosh, I talked to my city manager three weeks ago about this very issue. I'm just going to call him to see what he thinks. Like magic. <laughs> it would be great.